Hello once again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. And I'm down in my basement in beautiful Studio A. And this is one of the first videos that I've been making in the studio with my new South Bend 7 inch shaper. So today's video is all about making serrations in steel. What are serrations? Serrations are simply little parallel grooves running at uh, in a crisscross pattern like this to give you a diamond shape or they can be parallel and straight and square all different shapes typically like you see on the jaws of a vise used to give a better grip but it also might be used for uh, decorative purposes so that's what we're going to do on the shaper which seems to be about the perfect machine now these are some samples that I cut in rehearsal in uh, determining the distance between the grooves and the depth of the tool. And this was way too close. This is about what I want, kind of a diamond pattern. They do not need to come to a perfect point like a pyramid. Now here's another one that I did, 45 degree one way and 45 the other way. I didn't go all the way quite out to the end and I finally decided that my spacing should be 75 thousandths apart and 30 thousandths deep which is about 132nd and again they're at 45 degree angles and it gives a nice looking pattern don't you agree you don't want it so sharp that it would damage the work if it was a vice jaw let me also say that this is mild steel and if you wanted to make vice jaws, you would have to use tool steel and then heat treat it. And this is exactly what the final product will look like. Now there's no room for error here. If you misspace it, it will be very visible. That's quarter inch thick. I may be using something just a little bit thinner than that. Now what kind of tool should you use? Well to start out with in my experimenting I just used one of my, one of my regular threading tools off of the lathe held in the shaper uh, tool holder like this. I think that it lacked a little rigidity because this is only a quarter inch tool and uh, with the extension of this hanging down and everything there's a little bit of chatter. So. I decided I didn't want to use this, although it would work. I also experimented with a carbide threading tool, 60 degree, and I found that this is just a little bit too sharp. We need to have a little bit of a flat on the end. Furthermore, the interrupted cut caused me to break off several tips, so I just decided that carbide threading tool is not the tool to be. So I finally decided to grind another one and this is quarter inch thick high speed steel but it's about three eighths this way so I can hold this directly in the tool post rather than holding it in a tool holder and I can choke up on it as nice and short and rigid and just really everything that I want and I sharpened it to 60 degrees although that angle isn't real critical but just someplace in the ballpark and again the end, I'm not sure if you can see it here, is flattened about a 32nd across. That will give you a bit of a flat bottom on the groove, probably not visible here. But let's step over to the Shear Tomiko Optical Comparator and you'll see a close-up of this tool. And uh, this is what I'm going to use. And then after that, let's go on over to the shaper and start the project. And the 4-inch Colombian vise is a good example of serrations, is it not? So that might be a project that some of you need to tackle someday, but again, these would need to be made out of two. I'm at the Shear Tomiko Optical Comparator. Let's take a look at what the cutting tool looks like. That is the 60 degree tool that I use for the serrations. Notice the Singer sewing machine needle right next to it. And that needle is 30 thousandths, which is about a 30 second. Let's take a look at the setup. 
Notice that I have the tool installed in the tool post and it's per perfectly perpendicular. I checked it with a little square. Clapper box is free to move. The vise is swung over at 45 degrees to the right and I'll do half of the project with that set up and then I'll repeat with a turn to the left. I have the machine set at the slowest speed which is 45 strokes per minute. And I have an outrageously long stroke of 3 inches. Well why that long? Well, it needs to be that long so that it can cover uh, in a full stroke all the way across, if that makes any sense to you, because of the work being set at a diagonal. I will have to stop the machine and move it over between each groove. I cannot use the power feed because the maximum on this is 10 or 12 thousandths, and I need to be moving, what did I say, 75 thousandths. Now, you can certainly use the little graduated dial for that, but it's just so small in diameter it is hard to read. I prefer to use a dial indicator, so that's what I am going to use. And I'm using my relatively long travel Mittatoyo, has uh, two inches of travel held by the Noga so that I can position that. And I'll have to move this at least one time during the job, but I will bring that right up against like that and then zero it out. Now I am attempting to touch off without the machine running. I'm lowering the tool until it scratches just a little bit and then I will call that zero. Approaching it real slowly and it did scratch. I don't know if it shows up. I've moved the tool away from the work and I will set this for 30 thousandths and lock it right here the best I can. The height of the table is already set, so I'm locking right here. That's very, very important. And then tightening the table support. And there'll still be some movement. These machines are not rigid at all. I positioned the tool for the first cut just on the corner there. And now I'm going to set my dial indicator into the table here, so it's just barely touching. Perpendicular if I can. See it's contacting. And then I zero it out. I'll take the first cut at zero and then I will move each time 75 thousandths. Alright, here's the first cut. Very dramatic, don't you agree? So now I'm moving 75 thousandths. Oop, went by it right there. And I'm ready for the second cut. Always stop the machine a little bit away from the work.
Okay, I'm half done. That took about 10 minutes. Looks pretty good. Now I have to swing the vise 45 degrees in the other direction. I won't show that. Also notice that I'm on parallels here. And be sure and be careful and take a trial run always with your hand wheel over here before you commit yourself to your first cut to make sure that everything is clear and you're not going to crash. Did you notice that there's quite a bit of vibration and movement in the table? Just inherent in the small design. All right, here's the setup for the second half. Notice the vise swung the other way. The dial indicator repositioned. Also, did you notice that I let it make three or four passes across the work to take up any springiness in the tool or in the machine? And then it's really cut to full depth. And yes, you're right, the finish is not that great, but it, is, it really doesn't matter for this. More than likely, you do not have a dial indicator that is this long. You know, I use this one incher on some practice, but it's kind of a pain because you have to keep repositioning. I did have one that was even longer than this. It must have been a three or four inch sterret. I don't know what became of it. And there you have it. Well, what did you think? Did you like that? I did. I'm going to take it over to the bench and clean it and blow it off and degrease it and see what we got. Too good to be true. Now I ran a file across the edges here to get the burr off. I ran a brush with the grain, so to speak, and then I cleaned it with degreaser. And actually it's too good to be true. Now, I did not want the points to come up to a perfect pyramid, but you'll have to admit that turned out pretty well, considering this is something I haven't done much. Now, you can see how useful this would be, either as a decoration for some projects, or if you have to make those vice jaws that I talked about, but then again, that would have to be made out of tool steel if you're going to harden it, and then there would be holes drilled in here and other operations. So if you ever do this, practice a little bit with different settings and different widths. But remember what I told you about the spacing. It was 30 thousandths deep and 20, 75 thousandths between the grooves. And there's just a little bit of flat on the bottom, as I told you, because I was talking about uh, flattening the end of the tool just a little bit. 